Welcome to the Dice Tower, a series of video reviews about board and card games. Here are your hosts. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Liz Davidson. I'm Mike Delefio. And I'm Roy Kennedy. All right, so we brought in an expert, Liz, who likes historical games more than us, uh, in to talk about a brand new game. Mike and I did a paid playthrough of this game several weeks ago, The Shores of Tripoli. Um, and this is a game about the pretty much unknown war, at least nowadays it's unknown, other unless you listen to the Marine uh, song and then people know about the shores of Tripoli and that's pretty much it. I don't know that I ever hear anyone talk about Tripoli. Most of the cities in this game no one mentions except maybe Benghazi. Uh, but people are not talking about this time frame. Uh, so that makes it automatically interesting to me. Uh, was the theme interesting to you at all? Anyone? Liz? Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I don't, I mean, I typically play games that are set in more ancient times whenever possible, but um, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, it even, if you open the box and there's that print of a letter from Thomas Jefferson. That's so true. So this, this game is set in the 1800s and it's about the Barbary Coast Wars. So if you want to deal with piracy and also attempts at controlling international waters, then this game is for you. Now, this is an asymmetrical game, folks, where you're going to either be playing it's a two-player game, you'll be playing the U.S. Navy Marine Corps, or the Pirates of Tripoli. You can play it solo. If you do so, you are then just playing the U.S. against kind of a computerized or a, a what's the word for it? An automated, automated Tripoli player. Let's take a look at how it plays. So this is what the setup of the game looks like. We have some peace going on here in Gibraltar. Um, there's going to be a time track here. The game is going to take place over six years. Each year is going to be four turns to four seasons, su spring, summer, fall, and winter. Each player, the American player and the tri Tripolian player, are going to have three cards that are specifically they start the game with in front of them. And then they'll have a deck of cards. You'll shuffle this deck, and in the first four turns, at the beginning of each turn, you draw six cards. Uh, that will be all your cards. So then in 1805, you'll reshuffle any cards that you still have and draw them and in 1806 you'll draw the rest of your deck so you'll see every card that you have in your deck at least once um, a player has a limit of eight cards in their hand once players are done doing that at the beginning of a turn and sometimes there will be ships on this track here these ships will come out at the beginning of a turn if they're here then players are going to take turns four turns each starting with the American player and then over to Tripoli then back to America and you play a card when you play a card from your hand you have or in front of you you can always play one of the cards in front of you you have three different options both players have the option of playing the card as an event so maybe I want to play this card here this says place two Swedish frigates in the naval patrol zone of Tripoli but many of the events say after you play them as an event this card is removed from the game so I could remove this from the game and put these here. Now, not every event is going to say remove from the game. You'll see I'm looking through the American cards. Many of them do, but some of them, for example, move up to four American frigates, resolve any battles that result. I don't need to worry about that. The American player can do two other things with their card. They can discard a card, ignoring the event on the card, to build a gunboat, the smaller ship here in Malta, and they can have up to three gunboats in play. Or they can move two frigates. When you move your frigates, you can move them from any location to another location. They can move them to harbors. They can move them to the patrol areas outside of harbors. And you can see there's five different patrol areas, and then there are several harbors. If you move the ships to a harbor that has enemy troops, the cubes, then you'll do a bombardment. Whenever you do move your ships, a gunboat can come and join them, and you'll roll one die for each gunship and two dice for each frigate. Each six is a hit, and you'll remove troops for those hits. If you move into a spot that has an enemy fleet, you have a fleet fight, they will fire back, and the same thing happens. Small ships, the Corsairs, will, and the gunboats will roll one, the frigates will roll two dice. You need sixes to hit. Small ships take one hit to sink. The larger ships take two hits. If they only take one hit, then you'll simply place them on the next year here where they'll come back to that player. After any kind of attack, all the ships that participate in the attack from the American side go back to Malta. 
So that's what the Americans can do. The other side, the Tripoli player, has can discard a card to build another Corsair in Tripoli, or they can make a raid. Now, whenever they make a raid, they'll take all their ships from Tripoli and go out raiding. Before they do that, there's any ships that are patrolling in that area get to roll dice, two dice per ship, and a six. each six that's rolled will sink a, co a Corsair. For each Corsair that does not get sunk, they're going to roll a die, and on a five or six, they capture a merchant ship. Now, there's no merchant ships in this game, so we're using coins instead. And you'll take a coin for each merchant ship that's captured. And that's kind of the main play of the game. So it's all about victory conditions. There are 12 coins. If the Triple E player ever captures all 12 of those coins, they win the game. If they sink four American frigates every time it's had one of these is sunk, it's put in front of the Triple E player, they will also win the game. And if they survive to the end, the American player is a little trickier. They have one of their cards in your deck, and remember, you'll draw every card, so you'll see it, is a treaty card. And so if it's the fall of 18.5 or later, the city of Algiers, Tangier, and Tunis are at peace, the city of Dern has been captured, and there's no uh, Tripolitan frigates in the harbor of Tripoli, the Americans win. There's uh, quite a few things to do. And the other way the Americans can win is an assault in Tripoli, which only can be played in the fall of 18.5 or later. And basically, you take everything and you attack Tripoli, but you're going to need Hammett's army, which needs to be created with this card, and it needs the Hammett's Army will be created here, it needs to move here, here, and then here. So the Americans have several steps that they have to do to win the game. There are other things that will happen. The Tripoli player has an opportunity to bring in Algiers, Tunis, and Tangier into the game, and then they'll have these uh, Corsairs out there, which uh, sometimes you'll have cards that let them raid. The Swedish frigates can come in and go away. And there's a lot of nuance to the different cards here. We've done a live play on the channel, and you can go watch that to see how that works. But that's a b basic gist of how the game works. The game is very, very stock-oriented in the sense that you have these little wooden ships, wooden cubes. It's, it's fine. The, the orange and the red, it doesn't really matter the difference between them. The card quality is really good with, you know, decent, you know, I guess I, maybe it's public domain artwork, I'm not sure. My only quibble here is there's these three starting cards, so why don't they have a different back? I just don't see how that matters. It would be easier to figure out which, or a big star on them somewhere to know that they're the three starting cards that go in front of you. The game comes with a very big historical supplement, so if you want to read and learn about it, which I did, I read the whole thing. It's interesting to read about what exactly happened in this war. And, you know, it's kind of... Again, there's not a ton of pieces. There's different colored dice, but they're there for more for flavor than anything else. You know, you could roll the yellow dice for the Swedish and the blue dice for Americans, but it doesn't really matter what color dice you roll. The rules themselves are very simple. You'll be able to get in the game, I would imagine, after 15 minutes of explanation. Well, that's what I think about the components. What do you think, Liz? I was pleased with the components. I mean, it is on this very channel that y'all have made fun of me for playing <laughs> ugly games. And I think that we can all agree that the Stars of Tripoli is not ugly. Um, the component quality is good. Um, and I actually particularly like it because I do believe it's the first game from Fort Circle Games. And so if this is the new baseline for what to expect from them as a publisher, um, I'm pretty happy with it, actually. I, I don't disagree that it's a little bit sparse, but that's, that's fine with me at this point. Mike? I would consider it functional. Uh, the, the art is fine. I don't think it's anything that, that I would complain about. It's also not something that's going to make me do a double take when I walk by at the table. But again, this is in a genre that is not generally known. I, I may get trouble for this, but not generally known for gorgeous art, amazing over-the-top components. That's a, that's a grand statement <laughs> and a, an umbrella statement, but I'm going to stick with it. I think that this is perfectly functional art. And the components are nice. Uh, I enjoyed uh, having those wooden pieces of gold that, that, that gave me a satisfying feeling in my hand when I was taking them from you over and over again, Tom. So <laughs> no complaints <laughs> about the components. Uh, Roy, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I think they definitely, like you said, were very sufficeable, I guess. I mean, it, you've got cubes and little wooden ships. I really like the little cutouts of the wooden ships. That's that's pretty cute. And, and the co coins are good. Um, but yeah, nothing 
crazy to write home about. I'm all about these crazy, grandiose, extremely aesthetically looking good games. But I do think this is better than like little tiny like chits and things like that. So I found it quite enjoyable. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention here is the fact that this game builds on what a lot of games have done over the past decade or so with the card driven. You have a card and yeah. you can use it to do a couple actions or you can use it for the event on the card. And if you play it as the event, most of the time you get rid of that card. And this was made popular amongst those of us who weren't war gamers with Twilight Struggle and things like that. Mm -hmm. However, I got to say, the ease of this game and learning how to play it, I'm not saying learn how to play it well, the ease of this <laughs> game, I'm used to, you know, when I was first approached to play the game, I was kind of like, eh, we'll see. But I was told it was super fast, and indeed it was. It's a really quick easy to understand game and since these games often rely on you knowing what cards are in the deck i have almost both decks memorized at this point or at least a pretty good idea mm -hmm. of what cards exist in them now liz is this too light for you no i mean i'm an omni gamer i'll play the full range of games i actually because of the card um, mechanisms that you just mentioned, I just recommended Shores of Tripoli as an intro war game for people who want to get their feet wet and who are a little bit scared of war games because it teaches that you use a card for multiple purposes. Do I play it for the event? Do I discard it to do something else? That's something that shows up in a lot of war games as well. And I think this is a really friendly way to learn that. Uh, I, I think that it's a good and bad thing that you get to the point where you know that both decks so well. I think that it's nice to develop a sense of mastery over a game and be able to plan for a card because that feels really good. I also think that in some ways it does limit this game, especially because there are certain cards that can only be played at certain times because of the game's commitment to its historical timeline. And, you know, with so few cards and so many that can only play in like 1805, um, I, I do think there are some limitations to it in the long run, but it's fun and I've enjoyed it. What did you yeah, all I think, think about that thing? Sorry, yeah, I think the accessibility is probably the thing that is its best asset, quite honestly. I think it's a game that, you know, I was with you, Tom. I was a little bit hesitant to try this out because I felt like it might be out of my wheelhouse, so to speak. But I was pleasantly surprised with how quickly I was able to pick up the, the structure of the game. And there is this sense of discovery when you're looking through the deck and you're like, oh, oh, this could be cool. Now, a lot of the cards are very situational. Um, I think that, it, like Liz was saying to an extent, there's a double-edged sword with getting to know these decks really well. Knowing them well, then you have a little bit more of the meta you know, experience, especially if the person you're playing against also knows the cards as well as you do. Then you're kind of getting into the head of the, of the player a little bit more. But, again there might be some limit to the amount of legs this game has. I just don't know how many times you're going to want to play it once you've played it through. I also do wonder, I haven't played it enough to know this, but I do wonder if it maybe is a little bit scripted. I do feel like maybe there are certain moves that you're going to always kind of want to make at certain points in the game. Uh, as you were saying, Liz, there's kind of following this timeline, and it seems like there are little, like, hinge points in the game where you want to make sure you're doing something at at this particular point in the game and so i just wonder if that's going to play out i can't say for sure yeah i Roy? definitely agree as far as like feeling like some things are kind of scripted and the fact that you go through the entire deck means like almost every game unless for some reason the pirates like win super fast you're going to see the whole deck play out um, and of course the American player is hoping that doesn't happen. Um, but you're going to see certain cards and you know that they're going to have them in their hand. There are some so interesting scenarios where like somebody can get a card back from the discard pile and play it a second time that you might not be expecting. But for the most part, you're going to kind of know, okay, they have that in their deck. I should be preparing for this to come up. Okay. They played this and put some troops there. They probably have a card that's going to let them do something with those people there. Maybe I should stop them now. Um, you can kind of see a lot of the strategies as they're forming, which makes the game a a little bit i think a lot of the games are going to play very similarly as far as the same way but the main thing that is good about this game is just that ease and that ability to get into the game like from the get-go this is not a game that is going to be hard to jump into because it's so straightforward all right well i want to start this next part here actually with roy because i know how roy feels about it 
and then bounce back to y'all's responses to that. And so Roy and I uh, played this. We played it twice back to back. Um, and in the rules itself, it says, uh, it's like, hey, Americans, don't be discouraged. You're going to do pretty badly at the beginning of the game most of the time. And that's, I don't know how to overemphasize how much that's true. Um, then I went and read those tournament rules where mm -hmm. if you, you can play and you get a certain score, and actually the Americans can score higher than the, the Tripoli player if the Tripoli player doesn't kill enough ships. Right. So what we did is we played a game back and forth, and in the second game, when I played the Tripoli, I tried to kill more ships. And in doing so, I actually artificially lengthened the game. I could have won right. by getting more gold coins, but I didn't want to tie the game up. And I want to, I don't want to tie. I wanted to win, so I tried to kill another ship. And so that being said, Roy, what are your thoughts on the play balance? I, I think it's kind of, I don't know. It feels so much easier as a Pirates player. And I know the designer has said, oh, once you play the American player more, you'll be able to win more. I, I, every single game we played, the Pirates won that I know of. That's true. I'm not sure if that's I the same I played five with games play. and the Pirates have won all five. The Pirates have right. won all, all the times, and there's this whole back and forth with the tournament play as well that's basically, it's it's based on defeating ships, you know, and you have to, as the Pirates, be super lucky to be able to defeat ships because normally their ships are stronger than yours, um, and you have to kind of get your masses up to be able to go out and attack them, which, of course, hindering you from pillaging more. You can pretty easily pillage in this game, I feel like, as the Pirates, especially with all the cards that are in play. I mean, the card that, like, sends the two Dutch ships back and gives you two gold, it's like, well, maybe you shouldn't put the Dutch ships out in the first place. But if you don't, Pirates are going to be able to get gold easier anyway. It It's very deterministic on the dice rolls, on the whole, like, trying to pillage and get the gold pieces. But it seems like most of the games we played, the rolls were rolling pretty average. Like, we rolled, it's like, okay, that's kind of the average roll of what you would get with that many dice. I mean, the dice, the fact that you're rolling a whole lot of them, makes them kind of, like, mitigate the, the wild swings by the number of them that you're rolling. And even with all of that happening, it just seemed like consistently the pirate player could easily sneak in there and get a couple couple gold here and there. Um, there are some interesting tricks that the American player has with like making them lose two gold and then playing another card to make them lose two gold. But one of the interesting things I found in the tournament situation, if you're actually playing super competitive in this game, is if you could figure out a way to tie the game up, you could force ties. Because there were plenty of cards that were like, give the pirate player two gold and blow up their ships here. You could force the game to end in a tie, therefore not allowing them to actually beat you in like the tournament rules. Which I could totally see some people doing that sort of thing if they were playing this game. <laughs> Roy. I, I, there were so many times where I sing there and Tom's like, I need to kill one more of your ship. And I'm like, well, if you're not going to win, I could just force us to tie, which isn't necessarily a good feeling in a game. But I do think if you play the game more casually, it can be more enjoyable. I just wish it was a little, I, I wish it was a lot easier for the Americans to have more of a chance because it seems so tilted towards the Pirates. All right, Liz, what do you think? I, so I've mostly played this solo, right? which makes it a bit different. So I will say that, so when you are playing solo, you go up against the T-Bot as the mm. Americans. And so you don't have the option to actually play Tripoli very much. But yeah, I mean, it, I don't disagree with you about the die rolls generally averaging down over time, but it really does always seem like the pirates roll really well, and I'm not rolling really well, even if that's not actually true. Well, um, the they need can fives be and sixes, and you need sixes, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so the T-Bot can be surprisingly difficult to beat. Actually, should I just talk about that now? Yeah. Yeah, um, Mike, I'm, have you played it solo? I'll pass it to you after. I have, <laughs> no, I have not. You, you, you take on that. I haven't played it. Oh, no, okay, so solo okay. is actually really interesting for this because... I have mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, I think that it runs quite well. It's it's nice, it's clear. On the other, it really requires you to read the card text because a lot of the cards come in action. It's like, oh, when um, the T-Bot has its first successful raid, you play this card. You know, and there are things that you have, they're like little trigger points that you have to watch out for as you're playing. So because there's so few cards in the, in the decks, it's not as big a deal. But for solo, you're going to have to be ready to do a bit of bookkeeping. So basically, you'll lay out the three cards that you always lay out at the start of the game. And then you'll lay out some battle cards for the T-Bot. And you have to be aware of what they say. And then there are two solo-only cards that will basically create this cycle where the, the pirates continue to raid, depending on how many of them are actually in the harbor at Tripoli. If you reduce them to a certain number, then there's a different thing that comes into play that basically makes more ships repopulate. So the bot works pretty well. 
It's just that you have to be aware of special situations. You know, I'm waiting for the first successful raid to happen, or I'm waiting for this year to come, because then I know that X thing is going to have to happen, and I'm going to have to execute it on behalf of the AI. Um, I generally find it fun. I'm actually going to be filming a tutorial and posting it shortly on my own channel. But um, the, the one, I guess, quibble I have with it is that you have to actually read what each of those cards does and you have to know when to play it in ways that I think might be a little bit freaky for somebody who hasn't played a lot of solo games before. Hmm. If you play solo a lot, it's probably not a big deal. Yeah, I'm not sure where I land on this one yet, um, but in, the, in regards to balance, the, rolling a six is a weird combat thing for me. I'm used to rolling a five or six, or a four or five and six. Just a six is... I, I mean, I know that guns missed a lot back then, so that's kind of mm -hmm. bringing that into play. Mike, what's your uh, final thoughts on the game, and what would you rank it? Yeah, I'll really quickly uh, talk about balance, because that'll lead into this. My, my thought is... I haven't played enough to know if it's balanced or not, but I do feel comfortable saying that it is much more straightforward to play the Tripoli as the Tripoli player than as the American player. I mean, I think that that's almost undeniable. It's a much more straightforward path to victory. So uh, that being said, I do think that the game has a lot to offer. I think that it is quick, which is something that I appreciate in a game like this where you really feel the pacing of the game uh, as it goes through, it doesn't overstay its welcome. I feel like it is the type of game that you could play since it's a two-player game, essentially, or, or a solo game. If you're playing a two-player, you can play a game, switch sides, and play again, and I like that. Uh, I like how approachable it is. I don't know that it has a lot of legs. That's my main concern about it. I just don't know that it's a game I would come back to over and over and over again. Um, I, I'm landing at a 6.5 on it. I think it does a lot of things really well. I just don't know that it's something that I would want to play very often, especially once I know those decks. So that's where I land. Roy? I, I enjoyed the game. I thought the game was fun. I think this would be an interesting game to play, to show someone new, and as the experienced player, play the American side and then show somebody new the Tripoli side. But once they got more familiar with all the mechanics... The, problem, the Tripoli side feels like, oh my goodness, there's so many things stacked against the American side that they're, they're rolling those dice and stealing those coins a lot of the time. Um, but overall, I enjoy the way the mechanics work. I like chucking dice. I like having the combats. I like the idea of trying to sneak in and steal stuff from the American side. And I, I, the, it just feels so hard as the Americans going from this location to slowly going to this location, to slowly going to this location, then attacking Tripoli, which makes historical and thematic sense but in the, in the gameplay, it just feels like it's such a slog as the American player. I'm going to rate this a 6 overall. I think the game is fun to play and an easy introductory game, especially for like a history-style game. I think that's good. But I, I feel like it could be even bigger and better. Um, but you're going to see a lot of the same stuff in the decks over and over again. So, But I did enjoy it. And Liz? You know what? I'm going to be a little nicer. Um, I think that... so especially because I think it serves such a good role as an introductory mm -hmm. war game. I've noticed that people who play it have a good time. It's snappy. People usually play it more than once in a city. Um, I actually think that the T-Bot is pretty entertaining, even if it has some drawbacks. And, you know, for especially for a war game, it is a nice production. <laughs> and so I would probably give it... I will give it a seven for now. I think it's enjoyable. I think that people who are interested in historical gaming, especially intro level historical gaming, would like it. But I do agree that it's not necessarily a forever game, which is why I would not rate it higher than that. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm at, too. I would also give it a seven. And I acknowledge the game balance things that Roy sees. It definitely is easier to play as a AAA player. And I get that I'm not going to play it maybe more than 10 times, at, at least in a short period of time. You know, maybe right. once a year, pull it out. But I will say it was just really fun. As soon as I played it, I wanted to play it again. And then I wanted to pull it out and play it again. And then I wanted to play it again. I just find it fascinating. I like playing the Americans better because I think it's harder and it feels more challenging. Like, mm. I'll, you know, how can I stop these stupid pirates? You know, <laughs> I, I feel that, that, that cause in there. But to me, 
I think it's worth getting for that. It's also worth getting as an introductory thing. And it talks about a period of our history that a lot of people don't know about. I didn't know a lot about it. You know, that once you jump past the Revolutionary War, that we uh, usually start talking about the Civil War. But quite a few things happened in between there. So I think that that's good to know about that sort of thing. So anyway, that's the Shores of Tripoli. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Liz Davidson. I'm Mike Delicio. And I'm Roy Kennedy. Have fun on the shores of Tripoli. <laughs>